So, um, I did. What's that? I did. Well, well netbooks, I'm sure you do. You have a wireless card. Oh. I've got my desktop here. I wasn't thinking. So it, it doesn't matter. I'll just I'll just go from memory here. Um, guys, uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, at least my setup of a home theater PC using uh, uh, Linux, Myth TV, a uh, program called XBMC, and a little Python glue to stick it all together. Do you need that? No. I'll shut it off. Um, and uh, <laughs> All right. Um, XBMC is the is the primary application that I use just for for general purpose um, browsing of the media and indexing the content and matching up metadata, album art, stuff like that. It takes care of the bulk of that kind of work. Um, Myth TV also runs on the system. It has um, Myth TV. If you guys don't know, is a PBR software. Uh, it has a back-end process, and it can have a front-end process. Technically, you don't have to run it with a front-end. Um, but the back-end uh, takes care of um, uh, gathering um, guide data from, a, from an external source. Most people use uh, schedulesdirect.org. Um, here, let me just go right here in the front. Um, most people use schedulesdirect.org. Uh, it's, um, it's a service you pay like what, a little less than 20 bucks a year, I think. Or maybe it is 20 bucks a year. 20. And, uh, and you can get, uh, get all the guide data for your uh, cable or over-the-air programming. And um, so uh, Myth TV's back-end process takes care of downloading that data and processing it into a usable format, and it, and it stores it in a MySQL database. Uh, it also takes care of uh, scheduling programs to be recorded. Um, you can schedule those through the Myth TV front end, or you could log into the Myth TV's um, Myth Web, uh, which is basically a little uh, little web application that runs uh, on the box and you can log into the web interface and you can schedule schedule shows there. Uh, you can schedule shows uh, one-off. You can schedule them um, uh, on a repeating basis. Say say you wanted to record a particular program in the same time slot on the same channel every week. You could schedule it like that. Uh, you could schedule it to record any, any time a program comes on on a particular channel. Um, or you could record it to record any time it sees it at all. You can, you can also, these are all set up as, as recording rules, and you can set priorities for rules so that if anything conflicts, it decides which one gets the, gets the resources at any one time, since you probably have a finite number of tuners. You can only record a certain number of shows at any given time. Um, uh, with my uh, hardware setup, I basically just got a pretty plain Jane box. I actually used it as my gaming PC a couple years back before I built a new one. And uh, so it's a it's a um, an Athlon 64x2 with four gigs of RAM and a GeForce NVIDIA GeForce 8600 GTS uh, video card, and uh, so it's it's not anything particularly special as far as hardware is concerned. Uh, for capture cards, I use two cards. Uh, they're they're actually not cards so much because they're not they're not internal. They're both external cards. Uh, the first is the uh, Hapog HDP VR. It connects via USB to the machine, and it connects to uh, my charter um, uh, cable box via component video. So uh, you don't have to. You actually are capturing HD video, um, assuming the channel you're on is HD, of course. And um, the HD PVR takes care of capturing that component video, digitizing it, and encoding it to uh, H.264. Uh, which is uh, a pretty pretty decent video codec for uh, for size and quality, um, and it does that in hardware. So it delivers the, the already encoded video to the to the Myth TV box um, over uh, over USB. So you're uh, you don't necessarily for that purpose have to have a very powerful CPU because your CPU is not going to have to worry about encoding the video. It just basically pulls it off USB, records it to disk. Um, uh, the second uh, tuner I have is actually can tune uh, two shows at the same time. It's uh, it's a Silicon Dust uh, HD Home Run. It doesn't take it doesn't take um, cable channels. Uh, it it only does uh, ATSC over the air uh, digital TV. Uh, it's got two tuners built in. So I've got a I've got an over the air antenna that I have um, uh, screwed on my little porch area in my apartment. I'm probably violating my apartment contract by screwing it into the wood, but you know, whatever. <laughs> and uh, and 
uh, you know, got a little splitter that uh, plugs it into both of the of the tuners on that uh, on that HD home run, and so it can it can get most of the local channels that I would record off of. Unfortunately, uh, ABC's uh, the WLOS uh, transmitter doesn't transmit all that strongly, and uh, so I'm not picking that up on my on my uh, tuner at the moment. So I already getting lost. Yeah, uh, at the moment I'm not even recording lost tonight. Oh, I know, but but, um, but when I record lost, I just record it off the cable. Gotcha. Um, but uh, actually, my my real reason for getting the HD home run in the first place was because two of my favorite shows, Chuck and House, come on at the same time on different channels, and I, you know, I was I was I was stuck because I couldn't figure out which one I wanted to record, and um, you know, fortunately both of them are on Hulu, and uh, but. But the, uh, the HD home run will run you uh, in the $120 range, and so that can tune two shows at the same time. And that actually connects over um, over Ethernet. And Mid TV, whenever you add the tuner for the HD home run, it picks it up um, without any configuration really. It auto discovers it. You don't have to worry about IP addresses or anything like that. Uh, it picks it up automatically, and you, you just you just kind of say add this tuner, and it adds it. Uh, and then you tell it to scan channels, and it it figures out what channels you can tune in, and uh, you point it towards your guide, your, your schedule's direct account, and it pulls in all the data for what shows are coming on at what time. Uh, so in that way, uh, I could be recording two over-the-air shows um, and one cable show all at the same time on the box. Um, the, um, the shows that are recorded from the HD PVR, uh, there actually are different quality settings you can set within Myth TV. Um, for how heavily it compresses the data before it delivers it to your machine. And uh, I think I just have it set on the default, which will run you, I think, about 1.1 gigs per hour, which is actually pretty decent for, uh, and I believe that's for, for uh, 720p. The HD PVR can handle up to 1080i uh, video. Um, the, um, the HD Home Run actually, it has no concept of really um, Resolutions of media because it actually doesn't encode anything. Uh, if you guys know anything about um, over the air TV, the ATSC stuff that happens, um, it actually is broadcasting MPEG 2 that's already encoded. Uh, so the, the HD home run doesn't have to do much beyond you know capture the data and deliver it over the network. It doesn't have to do any encoding. Um, unfortunately, it's MPEG 2 and not a higher end codec. So Whenever you record over the air stuff, it's massive re relative to H.264. So you're going to see uh, video that's uh, I'm not I'm not remembering my numbers exactly here, but I'm I'm guessing it's probably uh, probably three or four times as large as, as something that I would capture over over cable uh, using the HD DVR, just because it's a it's an older codec that's not as efficient. Um, What's the cost on the Hapog? The Hapog device is about two hundred dollars. Uh, you can get it off of Newegg or Amazon. Pretty much, most most of the online um, <coughs> electronics dealers will have those. Are you those. controlling the cable box with FireWire or IR Blaster? Uh, both of those options are available. I personally am using IR Blasting, um, and I just leave my, my cable box turned on all the time, and um, and IR Blasts the um, the channel automatically to the to the cable box and tunes the channel, uh, and it magically knows how to tune the, um, the HD home run. I don't know. I don't know how that works. I just added the tuner and it knows how to, how to do it. Uh, one little caveat there with the, uh, with the HD PBR and the IR blasting. Uh, I actually had to write my own tuner script uh, because, um, I don't know, they, they just didn't include anything like that with Myth TV. Uh, they, whenever you're setting up the tuner, it asks you, um, you know, what, what executable you want to use the tune, to tune your device. Um, and so I did a little reading on the Myth TV wiki to see how to actually do the tuning. And then I had to write my own tuner script to, to, to do the tuning in the most efficient way. Um, uh, I will be um, posting the slide that I intended to present here um, on, the, uh, on the wiki. And I'll probably throw up there uh, some custom code that I've, that I've written to glue some of this stuff together. Uh, and I'll throw my tuning script up there. Um, a lot of that you'll have to modify uh, to your own setup if you want to use it, um, just because you probably don't have exactly the same cable tuner box that I do, uh, so you'll have to figure out what, what profile in LRC uh, can blast the right codes to your cable box. Um, 
and of course uh, with uh, another uh, a program that I've written to kind of glue XBMC and, Me and, and Myth TV together, you'd have to uh, modify that in order to support your uh, your own database settings for Myth TV because it logs into the Myth TV database to grab some data out. Um, and um, I think I've, I've stuck most of the variables that you would need to modify right at the top of the file uh, as constants for the program. So uh, let me just uh, demonstrate real quick what we have going on here. Um, this is a basic Mythbuntu install. Uh, Mythbuntu is a, is a variation of Ubuntu that's uh, specifically set up um, uh, to support MythTV. And um, most Linux distributions have, have some kind of MythTV install. I've just found that Mythbuntu is just really easy to get running out of the box. Um, and uh, it has a basic um, um, It has a basic XFCE-based desktop here, so if um, you know if you wanted to just close out your your Media Center app, uh, you could you know you know fire up uh, fire up your web browser and go surfing if you wanted to on a really big screen, and uh, um, basically do anything anything you need to on a general purpose computer right there. Uh, that said, I generally just uh, you know leave XBMC running all the time. Uh, what XBMC is going to be doing is uh, indexing local content, like I said earlier. Uh, it grabs uh, cover art for um, for movies and TV shows and so on, um, and it and it provides a nice interface for browsing that content. Um, so um, you can see it. Uh, I've got about 315 movies in this uh, in this list. Uh, some of those are. Um, Yes, MPAA, I did rip some DVDs of my own purchasing um, so that everything could be centralized. So sue me. Um, we only rip our own DVDs, right? That's right. That's right. We would never. Yeah. yeah. And um, a lot of these are things that have been recorded from uh, Myth TV. And I had to write some custom Python code to, to import that data into, um, into XBMC. Uh, because um, MythTV actually records those files in these nice little uh, file names that are mostly numbers and they don't have any correlation to the actual show other than I think like the time that it came on and the channel that it was reported on and they, they just put it in this format so that there's very little chance that they could collide as far as names are concerned when it's recording more than one show. But um, so my program um, scans the MythTV database for recorded programs. It figures out uh, what file names match up with what programs, and it creates a directory of symlinks that uh, the symlinks themselves are named um, appropriately so that XBMC can scan that list and pick up, you know, if it's a, it creates a movies folder and a TV shows folder, um, and, it, and it names the movies just by their, their, their name.mpeg. It doesn't really, the, the extension doesn't really matter. Um, and for the TV shows, it creates a little directory for each TV show and sticks in there. Um, it does some magic looking up through online databases and doing some fuzzy, fuzzy matching of strings. Um, uh, it matches up the season and episode numbers because that's what XBMC requires to pull the, the appropriate metadata from several online services. So um, if you notice this downloading TV show information right here, um, that's actually a cron script that's running my, my import script. It runs every hour and looks for any new content that MythTV has recorded. Um, and um, so it, it scans it. If, if it's already got it uh, in its database, it just ignores it and moves on. And if not, it'll go out and grab the metadata, cover art, and all that fun stuff. Um, you had to do all this yourself? It wouldn't, there's nothing that will do that? I did I find that some other people had written import scripts, but they didn't work like I wanted them to. So I wrote my own. And I personally think mine works the best, but you know, I might be a little biased. So um, it, 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 can it take a difference between <coughs> a repeating episode or a new episode? Um, well, MythTV is <coughs> not going to record a repeating episode. Right. Um, so I'm saying, you talk about recording rules, or is it, can you find it to do that at that level? To, to not record a repeat? Oh, yes. There, there, there are uh, rules that you can set that will say only record new episodes. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, what I haven't figured out how to do yet, I don't think that MythTV has the ability to do this, but if I have the same channel listed on multiple tuners, mm -hmm. I don't care which one it records it on. Yeah. Just record it on one. Yeah. Um, so, um, I haven't figured out how to do that yet. 
Uh, I think someone suggested that you just say record all episodes but only record new episodes and it'll figure out what channel, what, which tuner it needs to record it on to, to get the most uh, programming recorded that you requested. Um, but I didn't trust it, so I just set my rules up so that they generally don't collide. And if they do, I usually look a couple of days ahead of time to see if there are any conflicts. Uh, the web interface is quite nice. I'll show that here to you in just a second. And this error message is coming up because I don't have an internet connection when it's trying to scan for metadata on some new content that's imported. Um, the uh, TV shows look very similar. Um, it, it, it's kind of more of a hierarchical view. It's got uh, different TV shows that I've uh, reported or have local copies of. Um, so you can go in there and if, if you have multiple seasons, it'll, it'll give you a, you know, you can pick your season or you can say show all seasons. And um, it'll usually either have cover art there or it'll pick a little image out of the video itself. Um, and if you, if you hit the little info button, it'll give you a little synopsis of the episode. Uh, the date it was aired on, you know, blah, 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 all that wonderful information that you always want to see. Um, for movies, uh, you'll see uh, something similar. Um, uh, you know, synopsis, whatever. And uh, you can click on the cast and it'll tell you, you know, who was, who was playing in the, in the movie and so on. Um, if you go down through the library view, um, you can uh, you can go you know if if you wanted to you know say I wanted to watch a, a Mel Gibson movie or something uh, you can go down through the actors and uh, wow that's a lot of actors and uh, should have picked somebody with the first name starting with A but uh, Al Pacino instead yeah seriously um, da, 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 da. lots of J's. What remote are you using there? What's that? What remote are you using? This is a uh, is Microsoft IR MCE IR? version 2, and it is an IR remote. It is IR? Yeah. Um, so Mel Gibson, apparently I've only got two Mel Gibson movies, and, uh, and then you can pick that way. Um, this looks like an old recording. Um, an HD recording from TNT HD, it looks like. So, um, anyway. Uh, the nice thing about both XBMC and um, Myth TV is they support uh, NVIDIA's uh, VDPAU uh, API for video acceleration. So you don't have to have necessarily the fastest CPU on the market uh, to watch HD content. Um, if, you've got, uh, if you've got an 8000 series or newer NVIDIA card, most of those cards support VDPAU for, for video acceleration. I think the very first edition of the 8800 GT did not support it, um, but I think all of the 8600s do, uh, the 8400s, um, 8500s, and I think all of the 9000 series does, uh, and everything after that. Um, but I think I, I think there were just a few cards in the 8000 series that didn't. You just you just have to go you know go on Wikipedia and look up the Nvidia 8 series GPU, and, and they actually have a chart there that shows you which which chipsets support. Um, that VDPAU feature. And uh, if you have that feature, uh, some cards support decoding faster than others, obviously, because you have faster cards. Um, but generally, you're going you're gonna to get pretty decent support for that. Um, you know, this, I actually tried running um, with an older card in this machine um, that didn't have VDPAU support. And this is a dual core Athlon 64, and it had a hard time decoding a 720p video. It was it was actually skipping and uh, it was it was bad. It was bad. But um, uh, yeah, you do have to use the I Hate Freedom driver, as Jeremy would uh, Jeremy would call it, the the NVIDIA binary driver, not open source. Um, but uh, you know, luckily the the Mythbuntu installation kind of takes care of that for you, and you don't have to you don't have to go through the ugly steps of dealing with binary code yourself. You just kind of click on a button, and it, it takes care of it for you. So uh, you don't have to you don't have to wash your hands of, of your ugly binary usage. Um, um, In other words, I have a side out of mind. That's right. That's right. That's right. You can kind of do what you have to. 
So yes. that's a proprietary driver? It is. Yeah. It is so a proprietary driver. I don't, I'm not currently using any of those. What happens when you upgrade your kernel? Does that get upgraded automatically or is that um, painful? Uh, Ubuntu these days usually takes care of that without a problem. Um, a couple years ago I had a hiccup in the middle and, um, and it, um, it didn't quite install correctly. Um, most of the time these days it, it uses a, a program called DKMS, Dynamic Kernel Module System or something like that. Uh, it was created by Dell, I think, originally, and uh, they donated the code. And it takes care of, uh, when you upgrade your kernel, it automatically rebuilds any binary drivers that, uh, that need to be rebuilt um, for the new kernel that you have installed. So most of the time you don't have to worry about that. So how careful were you when you chose this NVIDIA card to make sure it was supported? Um, pretty much any modern NVIDIA card uh, beyond the 6000, or actually the, the 5000 series, is supported by the binary driver. So you don't have to worry too much about, uh, about the support on that. The 8000s are better? Yes. Like, yeah. Higher. Yes. Gen generally the higher number the better. Although they've they've kind of started resetting their numbering sequence again because they got up so high that you know ten thousand just doesn't look good because you, you just can't add another zero on the end and people like it so um, I think the, the the newest gaming PC I built has a GTX two hundred and sixty so you know two hundred and sixty smaller than than eighty six hundred but you know it's faster whatever it's it's a new chip is Nvidia usually a better card to go with over the ATI stuff uh, is it for just just because you were using this as a gaming PC to start with? I particularly, me personally, I prefer NVIDIA uh, because they've generally had better Linux support. Um, now, you know, the tide is starting to turn a little bit on that because ATI is starting to be a little more open source friendly. They're releasing uh, a lot more uh, driver code open source than NVIDIA is. But at the same time, I use what works and, and the NVIDIA works. Um, I don't... I don't investigate ATI too much, um, but I haven't seen any news that they have any kind of video acceleration on the card under Linux. So uh, that doesn't help too much when it comes to a home theater box. Um, sure, I'd like to use all open source code, but when it comes right down to practicality, um, if, if there's something binary that works better and it's not going to cost me an arm and a leg, okay. I got a buddy that built one of those, uh, the Atom. The 9300. Uh huh. It says it'll play 1080i. Yep. 10, whatever it is, I. Yeah. If you no do no VPNU, it's like with almost no CPU. Right. It's like five percent, like 200 bucks going with it. Right. If if you don't have video decoding on your video card, and of course drivers and software that support it, uh, you're going to see your CPU being smashed um, just by you know decoding a little 720p video, um, and you're going to regret it. So. Uh, don't in, don't invest heavy money in your CPU. Uh, invest in your video card. And um, yes. I'm sorry. Is there are there any more brands to consider like Intel for video cards? I think I think Intel. Well, Intel doesn't really have any desktop cards, as far as I know. They don't have any any discrete CPUs. No, um, they're all they're all built into the motherboard. Right. Um, I think some of the Nvidia chips have some some video decoding features. Uh, how comparable they are to VDPAU, I don't know. I personally haven't haven't investigated that too much. If anybody else knows anything about Intel and video decoding, I've heard that I've heard that there's some support there, but I don't know I don't know much about it beyond that some people have said it works. I believe I believe um, there's another piece of software that I have installed on here, but I don't use too much. Uh, it's called Boxy. It's actually based on XBMC, but they added some extra features for for streaming some more online sources. Um, That's Box with the Y? Box no, Boxy uh, with two E's on the end. Okay. And um, Boxy, I think, in their system requirements, I think they say they support either NVIDIA or um, Intel video <coughs> cards. So that would suggest there is some video decoding uh, on the Intel, in the Intel drivers and, and the hardware. Um, so any questions? Any other questions? Uh, just a ballpark figure, how much is like the 8,000 series video cards? I think, I think you can get an 8,000 series GeForce for less than 50 bucks. Um, 
At the time I bought this card, it was intended for gaming, and it was a mid-range card. It cost about 150. Was it an IPG card or is it? A it's actually a PCI Express. Um, I don't think they ever made any 8000 series AGP no. cards. I think they had fully migrated to P PCI Express at that point. I got the fastest one available on AGP. That's yeah, I, I, I think the 7900 GS was the it, last. It does okay on, on regular video, but you try, you try to push something like 720 or anything. Right. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah, unfortunately, back in the day, the 7900s, actually back all the way, I think, to the 6600s, they were they were advertising some video decoding features, but I think they only worked in Windows, and uh, they they weren't they weren't the same type of video decoding features as, as what you get with VDPA. It's fine for regular resolution. Sure. But you're just not going to push the high res. Um, anybody like to see a demonstration or whatever? What do you want to see? Um, the um, why did you choose the XBMC over something else? Or why did you add that on there? To yeah, why did you do that instead of just the standard Myth interface? The Myth interface, um, I just didn't like it as much. Uh, I actually, it's I have it set up here, and I've got a little shortcut to it, so I can launch it right from within XBMC. Um, this is what the Myth TV front end looks like if you launch it. Um, and if I watch live TV, that's what I usually do. I fire up the Myth TV front end, and I just hit watch TV, and it tunes the card and takes care of it from there. Uh, I didn't bring the tuner cards with me because there was nothing to plug them into. Um, but um, I didn't like their I didn't like their media browsing as much, just because it's you know it's all just kind of in there, and it's a big massive list. There's no organization of it at all. It doesn't pull much metadata other than the stuff that was already there on. Um, Guide, or guide information. Right. Yeah, that's guide pretty. That's pretty clean the way you got your XBMC run. I tried and gave up. Okay. It's it's mostly just um, so uh, the fact that I have that I have that Python script that creates the symlinks, um, and then I added that as a data source in uh, in XBMC. I I pointed actually I added two of the folders because it creates two subfolders, one for movies and one for TV, mm -hmm. and um, or TV shows, TV episodes, and. Uh, I told it this this movie folder is for uh, it actually has movies in it, uh, and the one for TV has TV episodes in it. How long have you been running that? Uh, this this box has probably been running for no, better I mean the part XBMC of part. the XBMC probably better part of six months. Okay. And um, I gave up on it a year ago. Okay, it's gotten a lot better, and I think I'm actually running an SVN um, copy of it. It's oh, a really? it's an SVN build. They have a they have a personal a PPA for for Ubuntu uh, up on launchpad.net and so um, occasionally I'll, I'll run an update and it'll get a new version of a, of a subversion build. So um, I actually had, hadn't tried it too much before that. They've got a Windows version running too, don't they? They do. There is a Windows and a Mac OS X version. And if you really want to run something on an old Xbox, I think they, I think they still have something that you can, you can do for that. Um, although I don't think you can run HD content on there because the, the machine's just not powerful enough to decode it. Okay, quick question before uh -huh. we go into your demo. Just uh, to, I guess, kind of review, you're, you're coming in through your breakout boxes, your USB. Right. And, and then going out to the television is coming out of the video card itself. Right. It's going over DVI, and I'm just converting it to, to um, HD. HDMI, yeah. which okay. are signal compatible. They're just different connectors, so you just buy a little adapter and it works. Okay. Um, so, I mean, gener generally the way I, the way I do it, um, because of that sync script that runs every hour, I generally have all up-to-date content within, uh, within XBMC. Uh, I'll usually go in through the library interface if I want to watch something, and I'll go through the recently added movies, uh, and that shows the most recently, you know, from, from bottom to top. Um, uh, the most recently added movies, and that way I, I don't have to scroll through this massive list of stuff to find the new stuff that might be there. Um, and uh, which, by the way, I just like to insert a note of, of annoyance here with TBS. Uh, TBS HD, um, they have the weirdest. Um, wh whoever controls what content goes on that channel, uh, they will take a standard definition show and stretch it out to 16 by 9 and throw it on the TBS HD channel. 
And I get excited because on the guide data, it says it's HD. Well, only because it's on an HD channel. And whenever I record it, like Die Hard, for example, the, um, see, it looks okay at the beginning, kind of, sort of. But uh, once the movie starts, really heavy. Um, it's it's kind of out of whack. You can see the faces are a little bit stretched. That was a four by three movie that they stretched to sixteen by nine. <laughs> and um, and there is uh, there is some stuff in here that you can do. You can change the video mode. But the problem is that the way TBS HD does their stretching, they don't do just a plain stretch the movie. They do some kind of weird. Um, stretch the outsides more than they stretch the insides. So the stuff in the, if, if you're watching it on a, on a 16 by nine screen, the stuff in the middle kind of looks like it's normal, but the stuff on the outside looks like it's stretched. I've noticed that on like HGTV too. Right. If they scroll across something, it, it's, it's, you notice that there's something wrong. Right. It's like you're looking through a so if you try to So if you try to stretch it back to four by three so you can get a correct aspect ratio, that doesn't even work either because now the inside looks like it's too skinny and the outside looks normal. So, um, TBS HD, if you're watching this, you're morons, okay? All right, just wanted to let you know. Um, and so I think I've recorded this movie like four times and I keep deleting it because I don't want a movie like that. I want a movie that's in the right, you know, I'd rather have it in 4x3, as, as long as it looks right. Um, I've got the disc if you want to borrow That's okay, that's all right, that's all right. Um, I, I usually try to get my movies through legitimate. I just meant to watch it. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> this is being video for me to rip it. <laughs> yes. Uh, is there a UPMP server on that so you can stream that? XBMC or? does have a UPMP server built in, and I believe Myth TV does as well. In fact, I think if the, I think I've I've added the Myth TV UPMP server into XBMC before. Whenever I was just experimenting how I was going to get my media from Myth TV into XBMC, that was before I'd written my, my Python script to do the the sim linking and all that. And um, it just there were certain things that didn't it didn't just didn't work very well mm -hmm. you doing that manner. And uh, the the metadata scanning didn't work all that good. Um, and I would click on things and it would say this item is no longer in the library. And I know I know it was still in the library, but it said it wasn't, and so I couldn't play the video that I wanted to play. And, um, so um, so so generally, whenever I'm I'm uh, browsing, I'll, I'll go to the recently added movies or recently added episodes, um, and uh, I usually schedule things to record at the weirdest possible hour, like two o'clock in the morning, so that whenever I, you know. It's, it's recording whenever I couldn't possibly want to watch live TV because honestly people do you stay up until three o'clock in the morning to watch TV I tried that one time for like a week and screwed up my sleep schedule it's just no fun you know waking up at two o'clock in the afternoon and you're like Ugh, and you want to sleep more but you know if you do you're never going to get to sleep that night and you're gonna muscle charger it's mostly info muscle it is it is <laughs> it's not me so um so that's generally the way the way that I work it um, of well, course, you can also do, like uh, internet radio stations. What's that? There may be a plugin for that. Uh, XBMC is is extensible via Python, and uh, in fact, these these little shortcuts that I added right here for um, sorry, uh, these little shortcuts for Myth TV and actually playing a DVD, which is a little bit broken right now. For some reason, DVD playing just broke on my system, and I don't know why. Um, so I'm I'm kind of working on that, but luckily I. I can riff on a different system and pull it in over here. In fact, my, my other machine is a Core i7, so it can it can actually um, rip a DVD and encode it and shoot it over the network to this thing faster than this thing can actually rip and encode it. Hmm. Um, it, it actually encodes three or four fa times faster than real time, which is really quite nice. Wow. Um, but uh, anyway, those are those are actually calling little Python scripts. The uh, the launching the Myth TV. Um, I had to figure out what the API was to tell XBMC to, to ignore all the remote commands because um, my, my first attempt was just to write a script that said os.system and launch the myth, myth front end. Um, but then both programs were grabbing the remote press, you know, key presses. And so I, I would exit Myth TV and then all of a sudden all these key presses would happen on the XBMC front end here. Um, and it would start doing weird things and go to some <laughs> random menu. And uh, that wasn't. 
uh, especially if that meant deleting files, that wouldn't be good at all. So, um, um, also, uh, if you go in here, there's they have different they have video plugins and music plugins and program programs that I don't know I don't know what the program what the difference is between a script and a program, but um, if you go into the video plugins, I've added some um, that um, you know it can pull from online sources. Uh, unfortunately, Hulu would be would be the most uh, desired source to stream things from I think these days. Uh, and it used to work in XBMC about a year and a half ago, I think. Uh, you could you could actually pull Hulu directly into XBMC, uh, but um, the Hulu content providers decided they didn't like that. And even though the, the Hulu people, while it was within their technical means to pull the commercials out, uh, they left all the commercials in. Um, and the content provider said, we just don't like you. And so they, they put an end to that. They started encrypting their... Uh, their uh, their feed streams and uh, I noticed you have CBS and ABC. Is there one for ABC? Not that I've seen. Um, lost it. Yes. Um, fortunately, that's not a problem usually because I just report it. Yeah. It shows up in my in my recent episode recordings or whatever. Uh, YouTube, I actually found has quite a few TV shows that I used to watch from the '90s. Anybody ever watch the show The Commission? Because the first two seasons are on on YouTube and actually pretty decent quality too, um, and so I've, I've been making my way through really tacky '90s TV shows that I used to watch when I was like ten Mr. years old. Mr. Belvedere. Mr. Belvedere. Yeah. I never watched that. I have heard of it. All right, I'll give you that. Um, and um, so, can, I, can you stream? Can you record from any streaming source? But I'm sure I'm there's probably a way you could do that, but I haven't tried. Channelsurfing.net, or have you ever tried? No. Um, uh, well, real quick question. Sure. We, we had YouTube and uh, NBC. Right. Uh, how are you watching online content? So this is just your player where you've recorded it, right? So how are you? Well. How are you going out on the net and watching streaming these, these, video? These things right here, this menu right here, mm -hmm. these are actually individual plugins. Um, it's actually, yeah, it's, I, I've, I've installed them inside of XBMC. They're actually okay. little Python programs. And um, whenever I click on that, it launches a Python script that probably pulls down from some web, you know, it, it parses some HTML page uh, pulls the content in and displays it as a list of menu items within XBMC. Okay. And then whenever I click on something to watch it, it, it parses out the stream location and starts streaming that into the video player that's built into XBMC. So you can't even do that with Hulu anymore? Is no. They, they uh, first of all, they don't use HTTP as their streaming um, medium. They use something called RTMP, and it's encrypted now. Okay. And there has been some. They're freedom um, haters, is what you said. Yes, they are. They are freedom even, haters. Even with commercials, they don't let you do it. Right. Wow. They killed and it on PS3 too. What's that? They killed it on PS3 too. Did they? You can't watch it on PS3 anymore. See, it's been a while. Sucks. Yeah, that's too bad. Now, the the Hulu desktop application is a possibility for future use, and I would probably throw it into, um, right into the script sub menu, just like I do with TV. Uh, unfortunately, um, their their desktop player for Linux is built on Flash, and uh, if anyone's tried to watch an HD video that has anything to do with Flash, it sucks on Linux because um, they don't do any real hardware decoding, and so you're just it's it's basically using your CPU just like um, watching a straight flat file would otherwise, and it sits there and chugs your CPU and it drops frames and tears the video and. You know, it's it's just nasty and horrible and wretched. So, um, does doesn't YouTube use Flash? Is there? A... They do if you watch it in the browser. Um, but this thing parses out the the actual link to the FLV file and streams that right into a into an actual player application, not a Flash player. Um, um, YouTube's FLV files are are just an H.264 video file. Um, and some audio codec inside of an FLV container. Um, 
And so it just it grabs that file and starts streaming it into the application, which is just playing H.264 and I'm guessing AAC, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, but I gotta run. Could, okay. Could I email you? Sure. Sometime after? Sure. My my email address, if anybody wants to email and ask questions, it's jpsutton at gmail.com. Although I would prefer if you wanted to ask questions, you just email the list, and that way everyone can benefit from any knowledge that's shared. Um, and of course, I'm not the master of all things HTPC, so anybody can answer questions and chime in if they think they have a. Have a an answer. What? I would just say email email the uh, the list. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And I, I read the list pretty. All right. Great. Pretty regularly. So. Th thanks a lot. Really yeah. Enjoy your presentation. Um. Do so that's about scripts it. Come in, does that come with eight, with XBMC or did you add that? The scripts menu? Yeah, the menu is, is yeah, it's 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 in XBMC. And there are actually other things that are available in this little menu on the side, but I've turned off some of them that I don't use, like weather. Um, if I want to know what the weather is, I'll just open the window or or open the blinds or something. I really have never seen the point of I mean, okay, all right, if you if you're really interested in what the forecast is tomorrow, but well radar. Right right too, on. Something's but coming your way. Yeah. <laughs> or if you're in a basement with no windows. Sure. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Or if you're going to the other part of the country. Or or if it's night. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> the stars. Don't know what's going on. <laughs> but seriously, when has the weatherman ever been right anyway? I mean I was up in Wisconsin last week. And it went from 70 to snowing in two days. And the weathermen, the weathermen had, you know, I actually looked at the forecast just to see what was going to happen, what was going to happen. And they didn't get it. And, and, and nobody, nobody saw snow coming. And it just, you know, I got up one morning. I had to get up early so I could work on somebody's network without other people getting mad. And it was like 3 o'clock in the morning. I, got, I get up, get dressed, and walk out the door, and it's snowing. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, uh... Any questions, guys? You said something about it automatically will pull out the commercials? Yeah, Myth TV uh, has a commercial flagging feature where it uses three methods of deciding whether a commercial has started or ended. And uh, things like uh, the volume change, you know, they usually jack the volume up whenever, yeah, yeah. whenever the commercial comes on. Um, black frames, there's on some channels they use, they'll, they'll insert a couple black frames between the, between the show and the commercial starting. Um, and uh, the logo in the corner of the screen it goes away. Most of the time, will go away a couple of seconds before the commercial starts. Right. And so it's actually it's actually not an algorithm so much as it is a heuristic, um, where it'll decide you know what's what's the percentage that this is a commercial starting or ending. And have you had any problems with it? Have you seen? It, um, it generally works okay, uh, and it has some adjustment that you can do within the TV setup program. You and you can turn it off. Um, with my Initially, when I wrote that symlink script that pulls stuff from Myth TV into that directory of symlinks, um, it didn't have the commercial skipping because that was something within the Myth TV application. It actually records in the Myth TV database the frame numbers where it thinks that commercials start. Huh, really? Wow. And um, I actually I, I added functionality to my to my I, I call my little linker MythBox link, and uh, I'm going to be publishing it on Google Code. Uh, in, uh, in a couple of weeks here, whenever I cleaned up the code to where it's not so embarrassing. And um, so uh, it actually generates a little, here, let me just, let me just pull it up here. You're gonna use Vim, right? <laughs> G-Vim. G-Vim. Oh, that's not good. You're never gonna be able to see that. Um, let's see, is there a reasonably? You do, if you open it back in your terminal, you can do control shift plus. Not an extra. Extra doesn't, doesn't do that. Does it? I think so. Try it right there. Just hit control shift and hit your plus sign. And it usually grows. You can set the font size using menus. It doesn't uh, under the profile. Huge. Well, I guess that's a little better. Um, 
Uh, I've got a I've got a RAID of uh, three 1.5 terabyte drives in this um, in this system. So it um, so you got 3.5 or 4.5. Well, it's um, 2.8 actually because you you lose one of those drives for the parity. So um, 2.8 terabytes. What RAID level did you say? RAID five. Hmm. Why do you choose that over another RAID level? Like RAID ten or um, RAID anything besides five? Just because a I'm comfortable enough with RAID 5. Yeah. Um, 10, you need two controllers. And most of the other, well, no, I'm using software RAID. Oh. Um, and most of the other RAID levels waste too much disk space on, on parity for me, personally. Um, and if and if I really did lose all that video data, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Sure. So, um, and, I, and I do back up most of the most of the stuff that I that I absolutely cannot lose, like, I would, I would rather lose all my video collection than my boot or than my music. Yeah. So my music gets backed up on my iPod, and, um, and my iPod is running Rockbox, by the way, so it's open source. Ooh. All right, okay. all right. <laughs> Just wanted to say that. Yeah. And I bought it used. Right. So I didn't pay any extra money to the evil corporation. <laughs> and uh, all right. So where were we? We were going to. Uh, cool. Grade. Well, um, let you go this time. And um, now I set up inside of my linker program so that it um, it knows that premium HD channels. It has a list of the a listing of all those channels so that it doesn't generate a commercial cut list um, for anything that was recorded on a premium HD channel. So uh, because those obviously don't have commercials, so what's the point? Um, if you see um, the blue the blue things on that uh, on that terminal are actually movies movie sim links. The ones that are kind of what is that red black whatever that is. Um, the ones that are black are the um, commercial cut list files that I generated from the MythDB database. So if we were to open up one of those, like license to kill, um, this is simply a list of, um, this, is a, this is the number of seconds into the movie that it's supposed to skip, a starting and ending. And, um, and the, the three on the outside is telling it this is a commercial we're skipping past because it has different types of skips. Um, so, so what are we actually? What file are we looking at? This is a file that my MythBox link program generated, telling it the time codes for when a commercial starts and ends. And so, this was uh, the movie License to Kill, one of the James Bond movies. Mm -hmm. uh, it was recorded on uh, USA HD. Was running. Um, Breakfast with Bond. Uh, a couple of months ago, they were running them like every every morning. They'd show a new Bond movie, and so I was able to record all of the all of the early Bond films. So who um, uses that file? Does XBMC? XBMC use that reads file? it automatically. It sees that um, uh, there's a. Did you write that? Write it to do that, or does it? No, XBMC already knows how to pick up that file. It uh, sees that there's a file called License to Kill mm -hmm. and there's a file called License to Kill PDL, and it. Since they're the same beginning name, um, it associates them together. And so whenever it plays back the MPEG, uh, it's, it reads the oh. commercial skip file and automatically skips the commercials. Um, and uh, now there is, there is a little bit of flakiness that's going on uh, because I don't think it's detecting, in order to generate the number of seconds uh, offset, because in the, in the MythTB database, it records a frame number to, to skip by. And with this one, I have to record a number of seconds in the recording to skip from and to, to skip the commercial. And so I have to reliably detect the frame rate in order to calculate that, that time offset correctly. <coughs> um, and on almost everything it works, but I found that some channels uh, on some tuners are, are, not, are not recording the frame rate quite right inside of the file. I'm not sure why that is, and I'm still trying to figure out a, a more reliable way of doing it. Right now, I have to, um, I have to hand the file to M player, and M, M player um, tells me what it thinks the frame rate is, and sometimes it's incorrect. So <laughs> I haven't figured out the pattern there yet. But it's not, a lot. It's a lot better than it used to be. But uh, your Hapog card does all the encoding, so it, no, Hapog does some of the encoding, and it pulls other stuff from the HD home run. So. Right, the, the home run, I, you said it runs on MPEG too. Right. So it, and actually, those are the ones that seem to be. Inconsistent, right? And I don't well, know why that the is. The fog, I would think, would 
Yeah, I don't think I've seen any problems with, with recording software R. But I, but I have seen things on the HD Home Run that uh, I, th I think it's mostly like The Office. Anything on NBC HD, I've seen The Office um, just skip at a weird time in the show, and it's not a it's not a commercial. And so, if if I hit the back button on the remote, it goes back to the point before that and continues on. You probably know, but you know, two stations use like 720, and two stations use 1080. Kind of right. Frame rates are different in those two. But those are. Um, I believe they're 1080i, and they might be, well, I don't know, I don't know. I wonder if it's just smart about anything to do with that. I know two, two stations have chosen one format, and two stations chose the other format. Yeah. Like NBC and CBS maybe went with 720, uh -huh. and ABC and Fox chose 1080, uh -huh. something like that. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, the, um, Midbox link code uh, is just running the cron job. And it's just a wonderful collection of Python code. Um, it gets kind of ugly. That's why I want to clean it up before I publish it on the internet. Because I'm, I'm sure that some employer is going to go out there and Google my name and find the code that I wrote and say, we don't want to hire this guy. You can't write code worth anything. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, um, it looks a lot better than it used to, but it's it's still a work in progress. It's only 200 lines. Um, yeah, the joy of Python. Just uh, just want to throw that plug out there for Python. It's it's You're pretty much the here. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, too bad Jeremy's not here to uh, to hear that plug, but uh, I'm sure he'll I'm sure he'll hear it when he starts. Well, it is his camera, right? Yeah, yeah. it is. It is. <laughs> Um, and also, this thing uh, imports the XBMC. XBMC has a Python API, and uh, it it uh, uses the the XBMC API to tell XBMC once it's done updating its list of symlinks uh, to go ahead and tell XBMC to update its library. So it scans through that that um, data sources that it has listed and automatically figures out what new content is there and so on. All right. I will be uh, publishing the slides that I had intended to present today, and foolishly left on um, on uh, Google's Google Docs, thinking that I would just plug in and show them. And uh, yeah, yeah, I should have done that. Well, I'll I'll throw it up on I'll throw it up on uh, on the wiki, and I'll throw up my um, my code once I'm. Satisfied that it's not going to embarrass me too much. And um, but someone's grandma wouldn't have to go through and do all this. They could just run this DD and that's that, right? Yeah. If, if, if you didn't care so much about the indexing uh, of the metadata and the cover art and all that fun stuff, uh, and you just wanted to run out of the. Um, here, let me show that to you real quick. Um, um, if, you, um, if you open up the MythDB front end, you can actually add your um, you can add your videos into a section called Myth Videos, um, and this is basically doing like a file browsing type type format. And so uh, I do have my my stuff reasonably well organized, and you can see that it picked up some cover art and metadata, um, but it just doesn't do it reliably. Obviously, it's got all these movies that it doesn't know anything about. Um, other than the file name, and um, so this just isn't a great way to, to browse the video, in my opinion. So um, so that's that's why I go with XBMC as my primary player and uh, gather of metadata and all that fun stuff. Um, because instead of playing with a Python script and putting variables in and uh, making sure you have all of the proper programs installed that it needs to scrape all these online sources, and then hoping that it gets the right metadata. Obviously, it picked up a whole, what, three movies at the top of this list, and it's never gotten anything more than that in, in, Myth, in Myth TV. After all that pain and agony that I went through. In XBMC, all I do is point it towards the folder, tell it it's a movie. You know, tell, tell it, I've got a bunch of movies in this folder, and it takes care of the rest. 
And I do the same thing for my TV shows. I add a, I add a folder and I say, there's a bunch of TV shows in this folder. And it figures out the rest. Um, so that's the way it works. Anybody want to watch a movie? <laughs> I do, I do get the XP and C. Is that a, a package? You there is a um, personal package archive that the XBMC authors have on launchpad.net. Yeah. Um, and I'm, or something yeah, yeah. I just add the sources in my sources.list and say aptitude install XBMC and, and it just installs. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, everybody in this room sees a dozen reasons why you're doing this on Linux, but if you had to convince somebody why you were going to make, you know, like a communal system, an uh -huh. entertainment system based on Linux, mm -hmm. are, are there any benefits that you have that you wouldn't get on, say, Windows or Mac OS X? Or? Um, personally, if you're not a tech person and you want to uh, and, if, and if you want to set up a, a media center, um, go for something a little more user-friendly. Uh, this is not a user-friendly approach until everything is set up. I mean, I mean, once you get everything set up, I turn the computer on, it boots up to the screen, and you navigate around with a remote. Okay, it's it's pretty easy to use. Um, but as far as setting it up, that's that's much more complex. Um, and so, if you're if you're not familiar with Linux, I wouldn't recommend trying to set something like this up. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this to my grandmother. Uh, I would just tell my grandmother to go buy a TiVo and be done with it. Um, if um, if you're a little more, you know, if you're a little more tech savvy, but you're not into Linux, then go buy a media center PC. Um, I'm not a diehard open source fan as far as you know. If I can't have it open source, I won't have it at all. Uh, I go for what's practical for the for the person that's using it. Um, whenever, was, whenever I was living with my parents, when I was in college, uh, I set something up that was like this. It was actually just the Myth TV front end. Um, and I was the one maintaining it, making sure that it stayed running. And my parents were the one, you know, pushing the buttons on the remote and navigating around. So they didn't really care what it was, what it was running so much, uh, as long as it stayed running. And uh, if it didn't run, my dad would unplug it from the TV and plug the cable box back into the TV and, you know, and he would say, we're not using that thing anymore. And then I'd fix it and plug it back in, and he'd be OK as long as it stayed running. <laughs> so have you had stay running problems with this one? No. Once, once I started using XBMC, uh, I've had little to no issues. I can't think of any major problems I've had in the last six months. i got one more. Uh, I, I used to have to really look at the Linux hardware compatibility list wow. before I bought anything at all. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned like, you know, three pieces of hardware. I can see you've got an infrared remote right. control thing there. You know, you, you chose like two external video thingamabobs. Right. Um, you can tell how much I've gotten from this presentation. Sure. <laughs> but like, I'll, I'll, I'll why did you go external versus internal? Did you did you buy six and return four? I mean, what? No, uh, I, I I did a little homework ahead of time. Um, the remote was was pretty much one of the most trusted remotes that Myth TV supported. Um, and really, it's it's getting to the point where um, there are remotes out there that claim, I mean, mo most of these remotes do not claim Linux support at all. I mean, you can look on the outside of the box and Linux is not supported on the box. But LIRC... That's a Microsoft remote. Exactly. I mean, this is a, this is a Microsoft remote. Seriously, people. <laughs> Philips made the remote, but they branded it Microsoft. Um, and um, the, um, the LIRC project supports a wide range of remotes that... Um, <coughs> were not originally intended to be run under under Windows or I'm sorry under under Linux. They were they were intended by the manufacturer to be run under Windows. And um, one interesting thing I, I used to have way back in the day, I bought this, you know, I was young and foolish and bought this Sound Blaster RG4 sound card when I thought that, you know, you know, onboard sound was just for the for the birds and I needed to buy a real sound card, you know. And um, 
and it came with a little IR remote and, a, and, a, and actually a receiver that looked almost identical to that Microsoft unit right there. And, uh, but the remote looked completely different. And when I first got it, I was like, I wonder if this would work on a Linux box that I had handy. And I plugged it in, it didn't work. Um, I, I did some Googling around and, and just nobody, no, a couple of people had tried to get it to work on their Linux and they couldn't get it to work correctly. Um, and a couple of years later, I, I threw it in a box and threw it in my closet. And a couple of years later, I moved into a department. And as I was moving stuff in, I discovered this remote in a box again. And uh, this time I plugged it in and um, I actually found it in the list when I was installing the Ubuntu of supported remotes. And, um, you know, two years after, after I'd originally bought it, someone had written up drivers for LARC and it works. Um, so buy old hardware. <laughs> you, you, you might could do that. I mean, this, there this remote right here, that. There, there are advantages to that. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, Most video stuff from the hog is supported. Yeah, not yeah. all of it. So right. Yeah, hog anything you'll be okay with. For the most part. There there are some of their um, well, like I said, some the of their devices part. that don't. But the, the general idea is um, go to the Myth TV wiki, uh, go to the Arch Linux wiki. Even if you're not using Arch Linux, the Arch Linux wiki is a priceless source of information when it comes to hardware compatibility and software configuration. Um, you know they they a lot of times have sample configuration files up there just posted on the wiki, and you don't have to be running Arch Linux to use them. Um, but they have a wiki page on, on just about any topic under the sun. And um, um, but the Myth TV wiki has 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 very good information, usually very up to date on what hardware is supported uh, and what features work and what features don't. Uh, for what it's worth, the the HD PVR actually comes with a remote and an IR receiver and an IR blaster, just like this. This thing has, you know, it's a remote receiver and IR blaster. Um, and the, at the time that I bought the HD PVR, they hadn't gotten the remote and the IR blaster working reliably. I think now six months, six or eight months later, they have it working. So I technically probably could configure the one that came with the HD PVR to, to work fine. Um, I just haven't done it because I've got this working very well. And in fact, the the one the remote that came with the HD PVR is bigger. It's got more buttons, and it's, you know, it's it's just more complicated. Uh, this is a very easy to use remote. Um, in fact, I really like that it, this particular remote. You can program the TV power button so that it'll it'll you can take your TV remote, hold it up to it, and it'll learn how to turn your TV on and off. Um, and you don't have to set up the IR blaster to blast your TV too. It, it blasts the signal right from this remote to the TV. Um, so I leave I leave the Myth TV box running with XPMC running on it, um, on all the time, and I just turn my TV off. Um, you know, TVs are more like computer monitors these days than they ever have been. So. So you mentioned like if you had a wireless keyboard, or you could sit on the couch and. Yeah. You don't have yours set up that way, right? You don't use this as a uh, computer. I do have a wireless keyboard and mouse connected to it. Yeah. Um, and I have it sitting on a little coffee table in front of my, in front of my TV. Um, but I generally don't need to use it. Um, now, if my brother comes over and he says, Jared, you have to watch this video on YouTube right now, then, um, then a lot of times, instead of trying to mess with the going through the YouTube plugin on here, uh, it has a YouTube plugin, but it's personally, other than other than the TV shows and movies they have on YouTube, the other, you know, just the searching for something on YouTube doesn't work very well in my opinion. And so I'll just close out of XBMC, or uh, if you hit the if you hit the backslash key on your keyboard, it'll go to a windowed mode, and then you can Alt Tab out of there and get to some other program. And so I'll open up a web browser and just go to YouTube. And yeah. Does it does it show up on your network? Or your home network? Yes. So you can save files or do whatever you want. Yes. To. Yeah. Um, I've got a I've got a Samba server um, running on here, and um, since it's plugged into my internal network, and it, it, you know I've got a pretty reasonably well configured firewall that's firewalling me from the internet. I, I leave my Samba server open to anything that's plugged into my network. And um, so if, you, if if I give you the the WPA key to log onto my my wireless network, you pretty much have full reign to add or delete files from my Linux box. 
Did you have to poke any holes or anything in your firewall to make all this work? Um, no. Now I did install a BitTorrent client on here, um, and I only get legal content. I'm just telling you people. I'm just, just saying. Um, it's just being recorded. That's right. That's right. I mean, occasionally I'll pull down a new ISO for a new Linux distribution, and and I like to use BitTorrent. Uh, it it saves the it saves the the distro a little bit of bandwidth if I use BitTorrent. You know. Um, and I think I turned on UPnP on my on my. Uh, router so that the BitTorrent client can tell the router I want to open this port uh, for sharing. And so that's I think that's the only configuration I had to do. And that wasn't really related to to that other than um, you know this box is all on all the time so I run my, my little BitTorrent client on there. Well I have another machine running all the time. Other questions? All right, well, I guess that's about it. It's about uh, 8, 12. If I hurry, I can get this set up before the new episode of Laws comes on. <laughs> can you, take the, you can take the output of uh, the Mint TV back in and burn that on a disk if you want to. Um, you can transcode, I guess. Yes, they, they, have, they, have, they, have, they have jobs that you can set up within Mint TV. Um, and a lot of people set up jobs so that uh, the things they record are automatically transcoded to smaller formats. I personally don't do that because I record so many things that it would spend more time encoding than it does recording stuff. Um, I mean, and of course it can it can it can transcode and record new stuff at the same time, but I just don't see the point. I've got plenty of storage space. I only keep um, most of the shows I record. I only keep the last fifteen episodes or so before they get deleted. Yeah. Um, What's that? Pocket video player or something you might want to put in like 320 by. Oh, sure. Something. And, and I'm, I'm, in those cases, I would just load it into, say, um, AVI DMUX and do it myself. Okay. I, I just I haven't seen the point of, of setting up a user job to do that for, for all videos. You know? um, and the, um, the format that the H, HDPVR recordings are in, 